Welcome to the Cairns Botanic Gardens Gondwana Heritage Garden audio tour. The tour is marked by red numbered signs featuring the audio tour icon. These match the locations marked on the audio tour map. When you arrive at a numbered location, press play on your audio device for information on what you are looking at. Each section ends with the sound of a croaking frog. When you hear the frog, pause the audio and make your way to the next location. When you arrive, restart the audio from where you left off. Now make your way to the starting location for the tour. It is marked B1 on the audio tour map and is in the Gondwana Heritage Garden Interpretive Shelter. When you arrive, restart the audio. Welcome to the beginning of life on Earth. Australia's Gondwan and Heritage Garden traces the evolutionary history of the plant kingdom and in particular the development of the Gondwanan component of this kingdom. Australian wet tropic species have been used to illustrate this history and some plants of special conservation interest have been included. Scientists believe that the Earth's continents were once a single large landmass called Pangaea. Pangaea formed about 415 million years ago. This single supercontinent divided around 208 million years ago, forming Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south. Gondwana consisted of what are now called Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, India, New Zealand, New Caledonia and Madagascar. Gondwana began to break up about 120 million years ago. Africa and India separated 100 million years ago and New Zealand and New Caledonia broke away from what is now the eastern edge of Australia about 80 million years ago. This left Australia and Antarctica united until about 50 million years ago. While Antarctica remained at the same latitude, Australia travelled, alone, northwards for 30 million years. Spend a couple of minutes here familiarising yourself with the movement of the Earth's land masses then step back thousands of years to your first stop on our evolution trail. Life begins. About 3,500 million years ago, life began. From down in the cool depths of the oceans, protected from harsh solar radiation, simple single-celled organisms emerged. From these simple bacteria-like organisms, evolved the first photosynthetic life forms. Among them, the cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae. Using the energy of the sun, the cyanobacteria began converting water and carbon dioxide to sugar. This process, called photosynthesis, produces a byproduct, oxygen. Over a long period of time, the oxygen produced by the primitive cyanobacteria escaped into the Earth's atmosphere, creating air capable of supporting life above water and a protective layer of ozone, screening the Earth's surface from the damaging rays of the sun. Stromatolites, relatives of these 3,500 million year old life forms, can be found today in the warm shallow waters of Magnetic Island off the coast of Townsville and Shark Bay in Western Australia. <coughs> Plants move on to the land. By the time plants moved on to the land around 420 million years ago, the supercontinent Pangaea was forming and many changes had occurred in the oceans. Multi-celled organisms had evolved, including shellfish and primitive fish, followed by the hard-shelled, slater-looking trilobites. The first land-dwelling photosynthetic organisms were most likely algae and lichens. Liverworts and mosses evolved from green algae and are considered the first true land plants. Liverworts and mosses are simple plants, lacking true leaves, roots or cells that transport nutrients and water. They have no flowers or seeds, instead they reproduce by dispersing spores. These primitive characteristics limit them to survival only in damp areas. If you look carefully around Zone 2, you will see today's incarnation of these simple plants growing on rocks and the trunks of the surrounding trees. 
The age of the ferns. By the time ferns arrived around 360 million years ago, Pangaea was well and truly established, and insects and amphibians had appeared. Ferns were an evolutionary step ahead of their predecessors, the mosses and lichens. Although they still dispersed by spore and lacked flowers and fruit, they had true roots, leaves and vessels. These advanced characteristics allowed ferns to grow above their more primitive relatives and to colonise drier areas. Like mosses and liverworts, ferns still needed water to reproduce. Their sperm had to swim to the female reproductive parts to facilitate fertilisation. The tree fern to your left is the scaly tree fern. This is probably the most commonly grown tree fern in Australia. The scaly tree fern can reach up to 12 metres in height, which isn't bad for a fern. What is even more remarkable is that the trunk is actually made up of roots. To your right grows another large fern, the king fern. Those massive fronds can reach up to 6 metres in length and are held erect by water pressure. Should the ground dry out too much, the fronds will droop and the fern will eventually die. In the wild, you will normally encounter the king fern growing very close to creeks and rivers. The age of the gymnosperms. The cycads. The gymnosperms, or naked seed plants, appeared around 318 million years ago, well before dinosaurs walked the earth. The conifers were the first of the gymnosperms to appear, followed by the cycads some 40 million years later. You may wonder why the cycads are planted before the conifers in this garden. Several of the cycad species used in this display prefer the moist, shaded conditions where Zone 4 is located. The gymnosperms were the first true seed plants and a significant step in their evolution. Seeds protected the embryonic plant, allowing it to be dispersed without drying out and provided it with nutrients in its early stages, giving it much greater chance of survival. The plant in front of you is called the zamia fern. Even though it has fern-like fronds, it is actually a locally endemic cycad. This cycad is regarded as one of the smallest, usually not growing much more than a metre in height. All parts of this plant are believed to be toxic. Despite this, the local Aboriginal people used to eat the seed after much treatment. Behind you, you will see several larger cycads. Hope cycad is another local plant that grows in protected gullies up to 20 metres in height, making it the world's tallest cycad. There are several very tall specimens of Hope cycad along the Blue Arrow Trail on Mount Whitfield. On your way up to Zone 5, keep a lookout for the Cycus, a local cycad from drier areas. <coughs> the age of the gymnosperms, the conifers. Another advantage that the gymnosperms had over more primitive plants was that they no longer needed water for fertilisation to occur. Pollen evolved to replace this need and allowed fertilisation to take place across great distances. The combination of seeds and pollen saw gymnosperms dominate the landscape for nearly 200 million years, during the same time that the dinosaurs roamed the earth. It was during this time that Pangaea began breaking up into Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south. The two mighty land masses slowly drifted apart, taking their living cargo of primitive plants with them. The wet tropics is home to some spectacular conifers, more commonly known as pine trees. Of them, the cowries are the grandest. They were nearly harvested to extinction in our early colonial days. Their timber was valued mostly for furniture and musical instruments. As you proceed down the path, the three larger trees on the left-hand side are the smooth bark cowrie, the bull cowrie and the black cowrie. On the right-hand side of the path is a selection of wet tropics conifers, including the black pine and brown pine. These are sometimes called broad-leaved pines. However, their leaves are actually flattened branchlets.
The age of the angiosperms, the flowering plants. The final major evolutionary step taken by the plant kingdom was the development of flowers and fruit. This occurred around 135 million years ago, when Gondwana was breaking up into the continents that we're familiar with today. By now, mammals and birds had joined life on Earth. Flowers made angiosperm pollination more efficient than that of their ancestors. They evolved colours, scents and nectar to attract animals that would inadvertently carry pollen from flower to flower in their search for food. In contrast, the pines shed large amounts of pollen, relying on the wind and chance that it would find a female cone to pollinate. Fruit protected the developing seeds and improved the efficiency of dispersing them. Seeds were dispensed after animals had eaten the fruit or the seeds developed wing-like structures to be carried by the wind or flotation devices to be dispersed by water. The wet tropics is home to many primitive flowering plant species that still exhibit ancient features. In this zone you will find many examples of these plants. As you walk around, keep a lookout for these unusual flowers. They are often small and difficult to see. Continental Collision and the Age of Exchange Around 15 million years ago, Australia, New Guinea and Southeast Asia collided with a part of the Northern Hemisphere landmass. This contact was short-lived but lasted long enough for an exchange of flora to take place. Some relatives of the plants from that exchange are still living in the wet tropics today. A selection of them has been planted in this section. They include gingers, bamboo, bananas and the Cape York fan palm. Some of Australia's flora moved to New Guinea, Southeast Asia and beyond. Did you know that there are eucalypts and grevilleas in New Guinea and Southeast Asia originating from this event? We hope you have enjoyed your botanic wander. This completes your Gondwanan Heritage Garden Walk. We hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the evolution of our plant life and what makes our habitat unique and worth conserving. There's more to explore, such as the Rainforest Boardwalk, or the freshwater and saltwater lakes. There's plenty more to learn at the Cairns Botanic Gardens Visitor Centre. You can wander down to the Tanks Art Centre to see what's on, and don't forget the monthly Sunday markets. If you are continuing on, stop for a well-earned coffee break at the cafe before you continue exploring. Or, if you are leaving us here, thank you for visiting our beautiful gardens, and we hope to welcome you back again soon.